Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the green economy, uh, about UNEP's work in the green economy, touch a little bit on how this is all moving and motoring towards uh, Rio plus 20, as you know, 20 years after the, the Earth Summit of 1992 that was going to solve all the problems of the world, and of course 40 years after Stockholm, uh, which uh, led to the establishment of the UN Environment Programme. And then um, maybe we can uh, touch a little bit uh, more directly on what we're discussing here. If you live in Nairobi, which uh, I do, um, and that is the headquarters of UNEP, then you have various lifelines to the outside world. One of those lifelines is The Economist, and the other is the BBC World Service Radio. And uh, I often fall to sleep with, with that thing on and wake up with rather interesting debates going on at three in the morning. And there was one the other day which, in a sense, encapsulates, I think, um, how desperate the world is getting. Uh, to find solutions to some of these challenges we're facing, the, the food security challenge uh, being one of the premier challenges that we have. And it was a debate with a chap from the University of Columbia, I think it was, in the United States, an ethics professor who has produced a new report on not geoengineering the planet, which some people talk about, but in a sense geoengineering humans. And the big debate was partly about meat. He was talking about meat and how we consume too much meat. How do we stop people eating so much meat? And uh, their study, uh, they have these recommendations. One was that they want to create a, a meat patch. So it would be like a nicotine patch. You'd put it on your arm, and if you get anywhere near a steak, you suddenly feel rather queasy. The other suggestion was that we need more small people. Because small people don't eat as much. And also, small people, uh, they don't need as big a cars and things like that, so less pollution. Overall, small people, good, because 100 years ago, we were, on average, five inches shorter. So this was the idea, and the BBC interviewer said, well, you know, how do you deal with the whole eugenics issue? You know, this is like engineering people. He said, well, maybe everyone can have one large child or two medium-sized children or three very small children. <laughs> so the future of the world clearly is short vegetarians. That's the way, the way forward. Um, <laughs> I think, of course, there are other ways of dealing with that. I'm actually a vegetarian these days because Ackensteiner took me to some slaughterhouses in Nairobi. And maybe instead of this debate here, we should organise trips to slaughterhouses, and that certainly would reduce meat consumption, I'm absolutely convinced. All right, I mention this because, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people do things. I don't eat meat because I'm squeamish about eating animals, basically. I don't do it for environmental reasons. Some people may not eat meat for environmental reasons. There's lots of reasons why we do things. And there's lots of reasons why politicians also make choices. They're under pressure to do this and that. And of course, politicians love very short answers and silver bullets and simple solutions. But we live in a world now of such complexity, and the challenges are so intertwined and so interconnected and so complex, we can no longer deal with simple solutions to the problems we have. You know, we cannot be reductionists anymore, and that's particularly the case in agriculture. There are no easy answers, but there are answers out there, and we need to get more complex. And in a sense, what we need to do is challenge some of the mythologies about the way the world operates, some of the kind of economic models we've inherited from the past 200 years, which may have been fine on a planet of a billion people, or half a billion people, or 10 people, I don't know, but it ain't going to work in a world of 7 billion going to over 9 billion by 2050. So in a sense, this is a little bit about what UNEP's green economy work is about. It's trying to bring the richness of our knowledge, particularly in terms of economics, because, you know, since 1992, the, the global economy has, you know, really roared everywhere. I mean, if you talk to China or India or elsewhere, they don't think this financial and economic crisis was a global one. They think it was something that happened here in Europe and the United States. And uh, so the economy's grown, and millions have been lifted out of poverty. Jolly good news, of course but we know it's come at a cost to the environment. Now, many people love the environment for all the right reasons. It's, it's pretty and, uh, and we like walking in it and we like smelling the flowers and watching the birds and things like that. But the fact is, unless we actually bring the economic value of nature to the attention of world leaders and politicians, we are probably going to travel down the same road. But we need to bring the complexity of the economics to them, but in a way that they can perhaps understand. So we need to grow the economy, uh, we need to basically find employment for half, uh, sorry, 1.3 billion people right now, underemployed or unemployed. 
and a half a billion just about to join the workforce, but we need to do it in ways that doesn't push us past those critical thresholds and those tipping points and those planetary boundaries. So the green economy that UNEP has been working on since about 2008, we didn't coin the term, NGOs had coined it before, but we brought a great deal of analysis to this debate over 10 sectors, one of which is <coughs> agriculture. And I think if you read the Green Economy Report, I have a synthesis here, but you can see it online, the full show is about 600 and odd pages. You can see that if you start splitting agriculture off into a box, away from transportation and water and all the others, you'll make the mistaken mistakes that we've all made in the past. You know, you need to bring the whole economy together in a sense, because they're all interlocking. I mean, if you look at South Africa, for example, South Africa is now going big on solar power. Why is South Africa going big on solar power? Well, the simple reason is it may be to do with climate change a bit. It may be to do with electrification of rural areas a bit. But the main reason is water. They're absolutely at the limit of their water. If they build any more coal-fired power stations or nuclear power stations, they don't have any water to cool them. And then you're trying to trade off electricity and water for agriculture and drinking water. You know, these kind of false trade-offs. This is, again, what the, the green economy is trying to do. So, I mean, for example, one of the sectors is forestry. You cannot have agriculture with forestry, without forestry. We know that. We know forestry recycles the nutrients. We know forestry generates a lot of the water. We know that forestry does extraordinary things in terms of supporting biodiversity. And when we say biodiversity, we know that biodiversity is also going to be the source of the next generation of crops. I'm not talking about GMOs. But we need that biodiversity to climate resilient crop, crops or whatever it is. And we need those forests as well for the below ground biodiversity. Because everything we see on top, whether it be crops or whether it be forests or pretty flowers or bees or us, depends on what's below the ground. So we need to look at everything through all the complexity of the lenses. You know, UNIP has done some work with, um, funded by the Global Environment Facility in about a dozen countries on assessing below ground biodiversity. And what interested me was one of the studies from a couple of years ago by the French and a tea plantation in Sri Lanka, which was they were hitting that tea plantation, 100 years old, with more and more fertilizers, more and more pesticides, and they weren't getting improvements in yields. They went to the nearby forest, which was originally what that tea plantation stood on, i.e. forest, got the wiggly worms and little beetles and bugs and things like that, grew them up, and re-injected them back in the soil, and the yields went up. So again, we've got to look at this whole issue of food supplies and this sort of thing in its complexity. Um, I won't go into too much detail of the actual numbers of the green economy. You can read it all about it. But it actually is already having an impact. In our country uh, that we're headquartered in, Kenya, they have the largest closed canopy forest in sub-Saharan Africa called the Mao Complex. It's been knocked down, degraded, cleared for intensive agriculture for a long time. A lot of political reasons, land grabs, whatever. We put on the table the economic value of the Mao complex, the Kenyan economy. The value in terms of nutrients for recycling for agriculture. The value in terms of the something like a dozen rivers that generate from this one forest. Some that go to the Masai Mara, you know, big for tourism revenue. We calculated the moisture for the local agricultural areas, including the tea industry generated by this forest. The services are worth $1.5 billion a year to the Kenyan economy. It sparked a huge debate within Kenya, and now restoration is undergoing of the Mao forest complex. Again, the economics are not about what nature is all about, but we need to tip the balance in terms of decision makers in favor of restoration and renovation and conservation away from degradation and with huge benefits for food security. Um, the report, also the Green Economy Report, showcases a lot of examples where we know the green economy is happening. We know organic agriculture is growing on this planet. You go to Uganda, you see the hundreds of thousands of farmers now involved in organic agriculture. Maybe not for the environmental benefits, but for the sheer fact that they're getting three times the price for their pineapples on the world market than they were before. So for them, it's actually really livelihoods that's selling a different kind of agricultural model. So we are coming up to Rio Plus 20. What can Rio Plus 20 do to this agenda? Rio Plus 20, OK, big ticket items on the table at Rio. The final phase out and phase down of fossil fuel subsidies. We know that fossil fuels are linked to fertilizer production, pesticide production. I saw a report this morning in my email, email box by some of our staff back at UNEP that in the United States alone, 
food and oil, the amount of oil used in the American economy for food, transportation, fertilizers, the whole system is perhaps 19% of the oil used in the USA. Now, if we, and the USA, by the way, subsidizes its oil industry heavily. By some estimates, just a year or so ago, the, the, the US uh, Treasury got zero cents back from uh, the fossil fuel industry because they paid so much out in exploration subsidies. In other parts of the world, they're consumer subsidies. So this might help the debate in shifting the balance towards more sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, away from uh, you know, intensive agriculture. Other subsidies, pesticides, fertilizers, those are being looked at as well at Rio Plus 20, not as intensively as the fossil fuel subsidies. So make a noise to your government, get them to put that on the agenda at Rio Plus 20. Fisheries, $27.1 billion of subsidies. You can't exclude fisheries in this, this story because we know it's a big source of protein. UNEP's analysis indicates only $8 billion of those $27 billion of subsidies are useful subsidies. They support things like marine protected areas and stuff like that. The rest, they're bad subsidies. Let's get rid of them, right? Put that on the agenda at Rio Plus 20. Ask your minister to do it. Okay, beyond GDP, everyone's now looking at this. A new indicator of wealth. GDP is very narrow, very blunt. We know you can chop all your trees down. You get a nice hit on your GDP because you sell them as logs. But basically, it doesn't say anything about the environmental services. There's a hot debate for Rio on beyond GDP. So ask your minister to get involved. Sustainable development goals. Am I close to wrapping up? Two minutes. OK. Sustainable development goals. They're on the agenda. We know we have the Millennium Development Goals for the, the poverty-related ones for, that expire in 2015. Some have been quite useful. Sustainable development goals are on the agenda at Rio Plus 20. Why? Because the rich world is also part of the problem. It's not just about the rich giving money to the poor to help them out of poverty, right? We're also part of the poverty story because of our greenhouse gas emissions or our ecological footprints in terms of food consumption and other things. So, get your minister to get involved in the Beyond GDP debate. I'm sure within five years we'll have a new indicator of wealth. Okay, wrapping up right now. So the green economy is not an alternative universe. It's meant to be a way of realizing sustainable development. The numbers about food waste, unbelievable, they're in this report as well. I talked yesterday to the European Commissioner's right-hand man on uh, 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 environment. Potochnik is the Commissioner, and his right-hand man, I forgot his name, but he's Finnish. They will be putting sustainable development goals down for the European Commission either today or tomorrow. And lo and behold, and it's absolutely fantastic, the food waste is one of the European Commission's sustainable development goal-type targets. Halving it, I think, Hans, is it? Halving. So the debate is happening. Rio Plus 20 needs to not just say we're all doing some nice things here and there with the green economy. It's alive and well. It needs to accelerate the green economy. It needs to scale up the green economy, not just in terms of agriculture, but all the sustainability challenges we are facing. And that's the opportunity for the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> just, just